One of the things we wanted to do first off, because new in my role as chair, coming along also new in the role here is a new CEO of the association. We have been left with a great group, a great association. We talked this morning, Senator Pat Roberts was with us to talk about Michael's tenure and his, his duties of growing this and the way he built the ESOP Association. When he decided to retire, uh, it gave us a chance to look far and wide for a leader that could help us do the things that we need to do. Grow the number of ESOPs, be an advocate for ESOPs, whether it be ESOPs in our community or ESOPs in the nation's capital where we are right now. But we looked and we narrowed it down. We found somebody that was the perfect fit for that. And we talked about doing speeches and coming up here and talking, you know, for several hours on end, which I have a clock here that says I should be stopping about now. But anyway, uh, we're going to invite Jim up and we're going to have a question and answer section where I'll ask him questions. Jim will provide some answers and we'll get to know him a little better, not only as a leader, but as a person and, and where he's looking to take the association in the near future and in the long-term future as well. So I would like to give a great big welcome to our new president and CEO, Mr. Jim Bonham. Right here. This is a little disconcerting here with Gary. You know, he's, he's a professional and I'm... I don't know if professional is the right word, uh, but it's, it's fun to be able to sit down and I'll try to do my best Anderson Cooper uh, routine. That's not hard. <laughs> uh, when we take a look at uh, some of the group down here, uh, I, I know because they're laughing and, and we ended up at a restaurant one night, actually it was a bar, and there was a band and we walk in after a meeting and the band just stopped and, and they welcomed Anderson Cooper to the event. And so we just played along with that. So we have a list of, and I put together a list of some questions that I uh, would like to talk to you about and, and really uh, just learn a little bit about you and why you are here and really what brought you here. So that's my first question. You know, a year ago, you were in a different position. You ran your own business. You were here in D.C. Today you're sitting in a white chair next to me. What brought you to the ESOP Association? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I've told all the groups that I've spoken to that uh, I'm genuinely humbled by this position. So it's, it's truly an honor. And yes, a year ago I was doing something else. But this is a terrific opportunity for me, and I, I, it's an amazing organization. So. About two years ago, I guess it's a little bit longer than that now, uh, I started thinking about doing something a little bit more mission driven with my career. Uh, I've spent the better part of about 25 years here in Washington doing just about every job you can do. You know, I've worked in both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Uh, I've, uh, I've done advance work. I've run a national political party committee. Uh, I've had my own business. Uh, and I've been a, a professional advocate um, for about the last 12 years. Um, had an amazing group of clients, uh, got to travel all over the country, um, sit in some uh, pretty uh, remarkable meetings and give some counsel to uh, some of the, our uh, leading leaders in both politics and business. And I've reached a point in my life where I wanted to do something where I can look back and say, you know what, I've made a real difference there because that's what I originally came to Washington to do. And so I started looking around and talked to a few friends and, uh, uh, and said, if you hear something, let me know. And sure enough, I got a phone call and they said, well, you know, there's this thing called the ESOP Association. Do you know anything about it? Well, well of course I do. Um, I knew what ESOPs were because when I was a staffer right out of college on the Hill, I handled some ESOP issues. Um, and not only that, but my best friend's wife was uh, actually at one point in time a communications director for the ESOP Association. So. I knew about it. Um, it took me about two seconds to say yes, I'd, I'd be thrilled to come in. Um, but for me, the reason I was really so excited about the ESOP Association was some personal family history. Um, and some of you have already heard me tell this story. I promise I'm not going to tell it as much as stories about Jake Pickle. Or, <laughs> but um, 
I'm originally from Wyoming, and uh, my grandfather uh, had a chain of stores uh, that he had started uh, and was trying to grow uh, across the southern part of Wyoming. And uh, there's a longer version, I'm telling the shorter version of the story right now. But one of his challenges was trying to find ways to manage those stores across very long distances, you know, 100 miles, 150 miles apart. And he had a very close friend who also ran these types of stores, um, and they had agreed not to compete against one another. And instead, they would get together once a month, and they would talk about business strategies and uh, what worked, what didn't work. And one of their constant challenges was trying to find ways to manage these stores in long distances. And they came up with this idea of, what if we loaned money to our store managers and our employees, and they could buy into the store? Um, so they tried it out, and it worked phenomenally. They created shares for their own employees, and it spread throughout their stores. And by the time my grandfather decided to retire, um, he decided to sell his stores to his best friend, who he had collaborated with for years at that point. And his best friend was a guy named James Cash Penny, J.C. Penny. And that chain of stores became, you know, there were the Golden Rule stores that later became the, J the foundation for the J.C. Penney uh, company. So this is part of my family's history, part of my family's lore. Uh, so the ability to come at this point in my career and help advance employee ownership, it just felt so naturally right to me. So I was thrilled at the opportunity and, uh, and I pursued it aggressively. One of the things that I know, this is your first conference. You've had a chance to, to be at some of the chapter meetings as you traveled around. What's ex what do you see that's exciting about employee ownership? You have the history, but as you're looking around, what do you see exciting that uh, really touches you? Well, I actually think that we are at a very unique juncture uh, in our country's history right now. Um, we're, having, well, we're having all kinds of debates, but the one that I'm most interested in is this discussion about um, wealth and income inequality, uh, how we make uh, everyday average workers feel more connected to the place where they work, um, where they can uh, grow some wealth, where they can have a stake in what they do. Um, and I think employee ownership, and I think ESOPs in particular, because you know, ESOPs in the employee ownership world were sort of the big dogs. Um, you know, the, the, the other forms of employee ownership, um, they're not gonna cover the millions of people that ESOPs can cover. And I think that there is a place in the next you know, five to 10 years for ESOPs and employee ownership to become a real solution to some of the biggest problems that we have in our country. So that's pretty exciting for me. Um, I think it's a real opportunity. But in terms of the community, all you have to do is look around the room. Um, you know, I, I, I gotta tell you, I, there were a couple of times last night, my wife had come and, and joined me for the, uh, uh, for the evening, and I wouldn't look over at her as people were walking up on stage, because I knew if I looked at her, she'd be tearing up. And if she did it, then I was going to do it. <laughs> but there's such emotion, there's such pride in what you all do. Um, it's just exciting to be part of that. People may know, want to know where you grew up. You mentioned Wyoming. Right. But what did you do as a kid growing up? Did you get in trouble a lot? Did yes. You, uh, yeah. Did you run yeah, campaigns yeah. for the school class? I did. Yeah. And, you know, I see my... my 13-year-old son back in the back of the room there. And, uh, hey, welcome. <laughs> um, he has a tie on and everything. Look he at does. Uh, yeah. yeah, it means that he's, his mom's going to make him go back to school this afternoon. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I would get in trouble. Um, my parents were both, uh, both teachers. Um, which meant you couldn't get away with anything at any school. Um, you, they would immediately get reported back to them. But uh, growing up, I, I had an, a, a, a love affair with the outdoors. Um, I always loved to be outdoors. I loved to go skiing. I loved to go hunting. I loved to go fishing. Um, and I think growing up you know, in a state where there are more sheep than people, um, <laughs> you, know, you, you tend to be a little bit more independent. And, I, and growing up on the edge of the wilderness, um, I would at times go, you know, I mean, my parents would be put in jail for it now, but I'd go up for, you know, two, three days into the mountains or, or longer uh, and come back and I'd be just fine. But I was a very independent um, child and very curious. Um, then I also had the bad habit of uh, dropping out of college to go run political campaigns. <laughs> um, and while 
I graduated from college late from my class, uh, a semester late. I actually ended up graduating in seven semesters instead of eight um, because I actually petitioned my, my school, Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. So, um, Any I'm, Nebraskans from Creighton? There we go. All right. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the current chairman of uh, ESCA uh, is a Creighton graduate as well, so we had a lovely dinner. But, um, you know, I, I had to petition the school to allow me to take more hours in my final semester uh, because, you know, when I went and I talked to the dean, I said, you know, listen, it's, a, it's an election year next year, and you know if I have four hours left to take, I'm not going to graduate. He's like, all right, and they let me take 25 hours my last semester because they knew I wouldn't come back. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I, I, I took long to graduate from college, but graduated in seven semesters and, uh, and immediately packed everything I owned into two suitcases and moved out to Washington, D.C. We're going to talk about something probably a little more meaty when we talk about where the association is going. But one other thing I know, that outdoors uh, desire to, to go do things fun has turned into a sailboating. You sail, you do a wonderful job, you sell on some championship things. And you're very competitive in that as well. Just a little bit. Just um, a little bit. Tell us yeah. about your boat. Uh, so, which one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, you can never have too many boats. Um, but uh, yes, I do. I do sail. My kids sail. Um, my my wife, who's back there with my son, uh, uh, when we were first starting to see each other. Uh, you know, I had told her I was always interested in sailing, and uh, you can imagine growing up in Wyoming, not a lot of opportunities to go sailing. Um, but moved out here and, you know, Annapolis and Chesapeake Bay, I decided I wanted to try to do it. And uh, uh, long story, but I ended up buying a boat, uh, more or less taught myself how to sail. Uh, and recently I've been competing in a class of boats called the J24. Uh, and uh, with the help of a lot of friends, um, have been able to be very competitive. We're going to be competing in this year's World Championship. Um, the J24 is the most widely sailed um, keelboat uh, in, the, in the world, about 5,400 worldwide that are actively sailed. Uh, and there will be 80 boats competing at the World Championships this year. And if, if I've learned anything about sailing, um, it's that everybody has their job. And if any one person doesn't do their job, you're not going to do well and the ability to create teamwork and accountability and then anticipate what each person is going to do, the choreography is really amazing. Um, I've also learned that you can't really use sailing analogies outside of the sailing world because nobody knows what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, one of the things is we'll go and head back a little bit. The, the sailing part of it comes with your movement to Washington, D.C. There are those of us that live in the Midwest, live outside of D.C., wondering why would anybody want to move to D.C.? What brought you to D.C. and really got you involved in politics? We'll talk a little bit about your background, then we'll roll back into where the ESOP mm -hmm. is going. But what, what brought you to D.C.? You've been here a while. I, I have been here a while. I've actually lived in Washington longer than anywhere else in my life. Um, you know, for me, it was always about public service. I wanted to come to Washington to be involved in public policy. I wanted to be involved largely in, in two main issues when I first came here. I wanted to be involved in healthcare uh, because when I was young, my father had a, a serious illness that, uh, you know, financially uh, was very difficult for my family. Uh, and I wanted to be involved in labor and employment issues. Um, the healthcare issues, I was deeply involved all the way through. Uh, uh, the passage of, of Obamacare. Um, I have you know, very dear friends who are uh, uh, highly engaged in the healthcare community. I um, had a lot of clients uh, in the healthcare space. Um, and you know, labor and employment issues have also been a big focus for my work uh, in 25 years. But I came to Washington because if you want to make a difference in your country, this is the place you go. You know, if you want to, the, the, the story is always, if you want to be an entertainer, you go to Los Angeles. If you want to be uh, in the financial community, you go to New York. If you want to be in policy and, uh, and, and help lead the country, you have to come to Washington. So that's what I did right away. You were with DCC for a while. You worked in, with Nancy Pelosi's team. You worked <coughs> inside several, several of the different aspects of politics. A yeah. uh, couple stories from those. Ooh, that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's sort of a code among campaigners that you don't talk about what you do, do on, a on a campaign. Um, you know, 
I've had the, the, the privilege of working for some really amazing leaders. Uh, and, you know, you always, it's interesting in, in Washington, the, the staff tends to take on the, the character of the member that they work for uh, or the official that they work for. And, you know, I had the, uh, the pleasure of working for a wonderful member of Congress from Sacramento, California, Bob Matsui. Uh, who was a very senior member of the House, who worked, he was on the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, and Bob was tough. Um, he was a, 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 a fabulous gentleman, but boy, he was tough, and he had really high expectations. And there's sort of this uh, understanding among the staff uh, that after you leave Bob's office, you start looking around and you realize, you know, what we've gone through, the, the intensity of the training that we went through, um, you run circles around everybody else. So I enjoyed working for Bob, I learned a ton from him. I worked in the U.S. Senate for uh, Senator Bingaman from New Mexico, um, who was also uh, one of the, the real giants in terms of legislative accomplishments, one of the nicest guys on the planet. Um, and then, of course, in the House, uh, I was uh, the, the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which is the uh, national political committee for the U.S. House of Representatives. Is that a fundraising job or is it? Well, there's a fundraising component to it, but we had um, oversight. You know, basically our job was to elect a majority in the House of Representatives. So we had at the peak of the cycle, um, you know, if you counted all of the field staff we had out, we, I had about 600 people reporting up to me. Um, I didn't, you know, have, the, obviously they were not direct reports. Uh, in the headquarters, we had about 110 staff. Um, and my job was to, yes, raise about $110 million in 18 months and spend $110 million in 18 months. Um, it was the, one of the best jobs and one of the worst jobs I've ever had because managing the politics of that um, and managing, you know, 50 state party committees is not all that different from working with 18 chapters. Um, and it's a, it was a, a, an invigorating experience. And in that, I had the opportunity to work uh, closely with now Speaker Pelosi. She was Democratic leader then. Um, the first thing that she did when she became Democratic leader in 2002 was start recruiting uh, Bob Matsui and I to go and work at the DCCC. And it was a, it was a challenging time because it was the, we were uh, implementing the first rewrite of campaign finance laws since 1978. Um, it was the, the McCain-Feingold bill had gone into place, so nobody knew what the rules were. Um, so we had to literally start from whole cloth and build an entire operation based on that. Uh, and I can tell you, um, whatever your politics are, whatever your views are, um, Nancy Pelosi is an amazing leader. And it's uh, one of the things about politics that it's, that's frustrating is that everybody outside of Washington gets almost like a, a carnival mirror uh, perspective of the leaders here in D.C. Yeah, it's, there's some kind of a reflection of who they are, but it's all warped and distorted based upon the filter it's coming through. Um, and I think that's particularly true with, uh, with Speaker Pelosi. Um, she is uh, a, a tough, tough leader. Um, and incredibly smart and so focused on details. I think that's, I, I attribute some of my focus on details to having worked with her because, you know, if you don't have perfect preparation, then you're not going to succeed. And so we focus on that. Our group had a chance to walk around the mall. We went around the White House this morning early and, you know, it doesn't appear to be a swamp here. Is well, it really a swamp? I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. I actually, I bristle a little bit at it. I'll be honest. Um, you know, it was a swamp technically, you know, yeah, there was the, the, the Washington Mall right down the street here it used to be a swamp. It came up, it got drained. But the, the people who come to Washington, the elected officials, um, they, wanted, they wanted to serve their country. And they have differing opinions sometimes about the best course for the country, the best way to serve their country. But they're all, I've, I've come across very few people uh, who are not of goodwill and good intent. Um, and that's particularly true with people who decide to go into uh, career service in the federal government. Um, these are people who are you know, very capable, they're very smart, they often have advanced degrees, and they choose to go into lower paying jobs for public service. And uh, so I have a lot of admiration for them. 
Um, and I think that uh, sometimes they really get a bum rap. So uh, no, I don't think Washington is a swamp. I think that uh, Washington gets characterized and warped and distorted like that carnival mirror. Um, and I, I, I wish there were a way to slow that down a little bit. Let's, let's change to how you take that analogy in, into ESOPs. We heard yesterday morning about how the ESOP community, the ESOP process is kind of a white hat process. How can you be against employee ownership? Is anybody here against employee ownership? Yeah, and so, but we have a good story to tell. Our board has been working on looking forward, leaning forward, trying to say, how do we create that, that vision going forward? And you're leading us that direction. How do you see that developing? Well, you know, we, we talked in the board, as you know, about sort of a six step process that we're going through right now. And, you know, the, the, the first step of that process is making sure that our own operations, our own house is in order, that we have given the staff and the organization and our chapters uh, all of the tools, the best tools that they need to do the job well. And so that's the first step, uh, making sure that the website works, making sure that the registration process, if you want to go to an event, you know, it, it, it doesn't take forever for the freaking website to load up. Um, sorry, I'm a little focused on the website right now. <laughs> um, and, but all of that requires you know, some, some savvy and uh, some, uh, some understanding of you know, the, the, the processes that people go through and the experience. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a phrase that's been bouncing around the national headquarters about user experience um, and, and customer experience. It's important because all of you, if you're frustrated in trying to interact with us, then you're not gonna be able to put the best face forward. So my first focus is on getting our own house in order, um, providing the best tools possible. Um, the second thing that I would say is that I think there's far too much focus inside the employee ownership community about this group is doing that and this group is doing that and you know everybody trying to out position one another. I just think that's silly. Um, I, I think that we should all be working together I think we have one common goal, and that's to find ways that more employees can become owners in the places where they work, where they can start growing their own wealth, where they can be participatory in their day-to-day -day lives. And if you think about how much of our lives we spent working in the office, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to pick on the realtors, but let me tell you, the realtors have done a really good job since the 1940s convincing everybody that the American dream is home ownership. For me, I think the American dream should be ownership of the place where you work, where you can be contributing to your family and your future, not just because the value of your home is going to go up, but you're building equity in your own life. That's the way I view employee ownership. So carry on that theme, uh, and I think nearly everyone, if everyone should agree with that, if, why not build your dream with your company that you're working with? Why not do that? How can we be more effective at selling that idea? Not only in DC, but in our states, and even in our own communities where people don't understand what an ESOP's about. Well, it's, it's, it's conferences like this. Um, you know, this conference is known for being about excellence in communications and how do we talk internally to our fellow employees and how do we talk and communicate externally about the value of an ESOP and you know even what an ESOP is. Um, you have to have a crisp message. Uh, you have to be able to articulate, um, you know, we'll learn a little bit tomorrow morning from Frank Luntz who is an amazing communicator, uh, that you need to say something three times before it will register with people. Um, you know, the first time is just sort of, you know, noise out there. The second time, well, it might register a little bit. It's not until the third time that people start to really gain an understanding of it. And if you think about communicating something as complicated as an ESOP, which by the way, I don't think it has to be complicated to communicate about ESOPs. I think we need to do the hard work to figure out the best ways to communicate about it. But Finding 
three opportunities to communicate in a way that it actually registers with people, that's a challenge. And it's a challenge I think as a community we need to, we need to confront. I was excited to see uh, somebody came up to me before this program said, we're gonna have to break out and go and up to the hill. They were at a 10 o'clock meeting, they wanted to do that. And I was really pleased to see that because advocacy is a part of what the mission is and making that happen. So while people here find on, on dealing with what's inside your ESOP, finding a better way to tell that story is important. Yesterday uh, morning at the chapter session, uh, you had a couple people in that were doing that and it was nice to hear what they told and you had some great sheets for that. You might tell the rest of the group a little bit about that. Sure, it was a, it was a great session and um, you know, one of the first things that I did when I uh, came to the office was I asked the staff to send me all of the feedback comments from the last couple of years conferences and they were big thick stacks and um, I took them home and I would sit there in my chair and read them um, and it took me about three nights to go through all of them. By the, third, by the fourth night I broke open the whiskey um, <laughs> and it, the uh, the, uh, I sort of lost my chain of thought there on the whiskey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, I think it's really important to, to uh, take into consideration the feedback that people are giving you and, and to, uh, to try to have continuous improvement in, uh, in the way that we run our, our, our programs. That's what I like yeah. about this group. Yeah. No one is hesitant to give feedback in this group. Right. I've learned that already. One day in, uh, people are not do not hesitate right. to hear some feedback. All right, I got my I got my train back now. All right, okay. you asked me about yesterday morning. Jeez. Yeah. So it's I, I'm on day four of this conference. For the record, you're all on day <laughs> one. So yesterday morning at the um, SRCC meeting, some of the feedback that I had observed was that um, people wanted more help in how to conduct a good congressional meeting. Um, and a lot of people were saying, you know, we kind of, you've done some of those trainings, but then you, you do it at the end of the day after everybody's already had their meetings. So bright and early yesterday morning, um, you know, I reached out to a couple of friends of mine, um, one a Republican, one a Democrat. Yes, we all do actually get along here. Um, and asked them to come and join me. Um, you'll all be surprised, I'm sure, shocked, that there is a little bit of a black market in Washington where, hey, will you come talk to my conference and I'll come talk to your conference and everybody's like, sure, we'll do it. Um, so I invited uh, former Congressman Earl Pomeroy from North Dakota, who served 18 years in the House Ways and Means Committee, was a major champion for ESOPs. Um, in fact, uh, he was such a champion for ESOPs, his legislative director now works over at ESCA um, as uh, an advocate for uh, employee ownership. Um, I asked Earl to come, um, and I also asked my, my good friend Matt Keelan, who is uh, routinely ranked as one of the top, you know, two or three Republican lobbyists in town uh, to talk, uh, both from Earl's perspective as a former member of Congress, what's it like to be on the other side of the table? And you know, Earl went through, these are my seven rules for effective advocacy. Um, and then Matt talked about the perspective of being a, uh, how you can communicate to a Republican versus how you can communicate to a Democrat. And you know, everybody supports employee ownership, but you want to, um, spin it in just a little bit different way. Um, and then uh, I pretty much you know, just sat there and basked in their glow. Uh, <laughs> but it was a good session. And one of the nice things is that we, we, we put out uh, uh, some one-pagers. Uh, we outlined, all right, you, always, you do this, don't do that. Um, and what was great is that after that session, people started going to the Hill and then coming back and saying, we tried it, it worked. It was one of the best meetings we've ever had. So that was gratifying for me to know that you know, we have a session, we taught people how to do it really well, they did it and they came back and they were just, this was amazing. Now, the people in that group received this packet where they had the questions, talking about the different bills, where you were, what, you, what the request should be, always make an ask. Can others find that same information? Absolutely, it's gonna be on the website. Um, if it's not already, I'm looking back corner there, I think uh, uh, they're, they're, they're gonna get it up there. If it, I think it should be there now. Um, we'll have packets available uh, back by the registration desk. Um, one of the things that I, I really wanna do um, is, is step up our advocacy program. We've already done it uh, to a certain degree. Um, Michael Keeling was absolutely right that 
the real value of our advocacy, the, 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 the real um, sort of the, 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 the meat of it is all of your presence in the congressional and Senate congressional districts and in the states where these members are elected from because you're real. You're tangible, your workers, your jobs, your production, you do real things. The, the member can come and say, yeah, these are my voters. So having a constituency-based approach is very important. But that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is the inertia that exists in the policy-making apparatus. You can't just have one meeting in August and think that you've successfully advocated for the year. It must be continuous pressure. Um, you know, the, the average member of the House of Representatives has about 770,000 people in their district. And they're receiving, on average, about 15,000 meeting requests a year. Now, if you are not constantly moving yourself to the top of the stack, uh, getting your, keeping your issue at the top of their agenda, um, then you're going to fall to the wayside because you know, the, the, the term, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, it's true um, when it comes to Washington and advocacy. So one of the things that I really want to focus on, um, you know, the ESOP Association, we're, we're a 501c6, so we're organized to be an advocacy organization. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's time that we really step up our game. And we're focusing not only on some of the bills that are in the, in the Congress, and by the way, there are going to be some new bills introduced today, in the Senate, um, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Bernie Sanders have two pieces of legislation. And thank you to the New England uh, delegation for all of your hard work in, uh, in helping to facilitate that. Um, so there's, there's legislation, but we're also focusing on the Department of Labor and finding ways that we can work uh, more collaborative, collaboratively with them, but also recognizing that you know, the enforcement division uh, may not be the most fertile ground for us to seek policy changes because the enforcement division isn't going to change the policy. The politicals and the policy shops will, uh, and the Congress will. Uh, so I think growing our advocacy program and then also reaching out to the states. Um, we've already weighed in, and I've, I've only been in uh, my this position for about 85 days or so. Um, we've already weighed in on legislation in Texas, Oregon, um, and Maine. Um, oh, I'm sorry, four, Minnesota as well. So uh, we're, uh, we're going to become much more engaged nationwide um, and try to push that forward. You mentioned the DOL. That seems to be one of those things that kind of gets everybody's blood pressure up a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, you mentioned the enforcement side, but is there, are there better ways you see of changing what their thinking is there? Yeah, well, so first of all, the Department of Labor, no government agency is a monolith. Uh, so for us to say, well, Department of Labor hates ESOPs, that's just not true. I can tell you flat out, it's not true. Um, there are uh, folks in the enforcement division uh, who their job, their specific job is to protect employees. Now, as lawyers, and I can say this because my wife's a lawyer and she works for a government agency, so I've got a pretty <laughs> good She's taking of notes this. back there. No, yeah, yeah, well, she doesn't need to take notes. She's got a <laughs> mind like a steel trap there. So she'll remember this all. But in an enforcement agency, they want the broadest prosecutorial discretion that they can get, right? Because that gives them latitude to move around and, sit and take a position over here on one case and a position over here on a different case because they know that one, does, one case doesn't really impact the other. Well, on the receiving end, for us, that just looks like, well, the Department of Labor is con contradicting itself. You know, on this case, they said this. In this case, they said that. Um, well, the, the enforcement division isn't going to tie its own hands. So we can work with them and we can explain to them, you know, that's not a very good approach or we can, uh, individual companies can defend themselves. The place where I think we need to be focusing is on the policy side, um, talking with the, uh, the, the uh, assistant secretary, uh, talking with the secretary, talking with the White House, going to the Hill, talking with our members of Congress, not necessarily asking the members of Congress to weigh in on this case or that case, because members of Congress don't like to weigh in on active cases. Um, there's sort of a rule against that, because it looks like you're trying to um, 
uh, influence a judicial process, is the way that they look at it, uh, unfairly. And they can get themselves in the political hot water for doing that. But instead, focusing on the leadership so that the word from leadership comes down, okay, enforcement guys, do your thing. But by the way, we need to give some better guidance to this community of people and community of businesses that we like. And our policy is to promote employee ownership, not to squash it. So enforce the rules, but do so while helping people not require enforcement. You know, make it more clear on what we should be doing. So we should be seeking guidance, um, indications of this process works better, don't do this. And I can, I, I can guarantee you that every professional that I've met, you know, uh, pr the professional trustees, the lawyers, everybody's like, just tell us what to do and we will do it immediately because this regulation by litigation doesn't work. And it's hurting the very people that the, uh, the enforcement division is trying to protect. It's hurting the employees. You've already done some first steps on that, correct? We have. We've had a, a, a couple of meetings. Um, uh, we had what I would call very uh, uh, productive meeting over the department later a couple of weeks ago. Um, a group of, uh, of individuals had gotten together uh, and developed over the last couple of years um, what some proposed guidance might look like. Um, the reaction was, you know, some of this obviously we would never adopt. But there are other parts of this that we think uh, you know, we would be interested in taking a look at, but break it down for us. That was the message that I heard is you know, don't ask us to issue guidance on you know, five different things. Let's try to take bite-sized pieces. Um, and that's one of the things that I always like to say in, in, in terms of my own leadership style is you know, if, you, if you look at one big giant problem, uh, it always looks insurmountable. But if you can break it down into smaller pieces and smaller steps, you can accomplish anything. And I think that we can do that with the Department of Labor. I think you'll get plenty of help from this group uh, encouraging great. that process along. So I've already had a lot of input on this one. Very good. Um, talk about, you said 85 days. Uh, you spent time touring, uh, really getting to know people in the chapter meetings. Uh, what did you learn there? Um, I learned first, never follow Gary Shorman on an introduction. Um, we, 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 he and Dan were great last night. I mean, I got to tell you, uh, amazing watching you in action. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I made a commitment to myself, um, even before my first day on the job, that I wanted to visit each of the 18 chapters within my first year. I think that's really important. Um, the chapters are all so different, you're all so unique, um, that I want to get a feel for it. Um, the, uh, I, I've been able to uh, make a number of trips, um, visiting both chapters and a couple of companies. Um, and my goal, like I said, is to visit all 18 by the end of the year. It's a little bit of a challenge because you all tend to sometimes schedule on top of one another, um, but we'll get there. We've got it mapped out. Dan Marcu helped me do that. Um, the one thing that I can say that uh, has really been striking to me is the energy that you see in these meetings and how much interest and curiosity there is to learn from one another. Um, I adore curious people. Um, I am constantly looking for new things to do, and um, you know, uh, you know, I, when I get interested in something, in the stack of books and magazines on my nightstand, you know, usually takes overtakes the lamp. <laughs> but the the curiosity in the community is 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 amazing. The second thing that, and this is going to sound a little bit strange, but it's the the leadership, the the chapter presidents. They're all going up and they're, they're talking at the beginning of the, uh, of the meetings, and they're all so nervous. Now, why, does this, why do I make note of that? People don't get nervous if they don't care. And the people who are, you know, and, and leaders don't just become leaders overnight. You know, they've sort of, you know, their, their, their peers have decided, you know, you are somebody that we want to help take us into the future. But they're still nervous. And I just think that's so cool because they care about the job they're doing. They care about the people they're about to stand up in front of. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's indicative of the types of people who are attracted to this community, the types of people who uh, work in ESOPs. You care about one another. And that's sort of one of the essential elements of employee ownership. Uh, you know, no, everybody holds one another accountable. 
I find it an adventure at any table you sit at and you meet people around the table, they all talk about their jobs like it is their number one thing that they have. They talk about their company, their job, their fellow workers, and it's so great to see that. And I know as you're traveling, it's a great chance to meet people one-on-one, -on -one, but it's also a chance for you to learn more and more yeah. about the ESOP community and what we're doing. I have, a list of, I have a list of some questions here that really are future leaning of where you see the ESOP Association going. Take a few minutes to talk about that and then want sure. to talk about kind of the rest of the show here. Um, first question, you know, there's, you mentioned a little bit early on uh, about all the other organizations. How do, we, how do we build ESOPs with the other organizations? How do you see us going forward with yeah. that? You know, it was funny. Um, NCEO had their conference up in Pittsburgh this year uh, in, in, I guess it was early April. And I'd only been on the job about you know, five weeks or so, and we had set up a Twitter account for me. Uh, and I had started to, to tweet a little bit. I was a big tweeter before. Um, I'm really not the best at it now either. I'll get better, I promise. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I came in the office the morning that they were starting their conference in Pittsburgh. And I thought, you know, hey, they're kicking off. You know, I fired off a tweet, you know, good luck to our friends at the NCEO in Pittsburgh. And I've had a number of people come up to me here and say, you don't know how much that meant to the folks who were up in Pittsburgh. And I was like, it's just a, you know, I wish them well. And, and I, we should wish them well. They're, they're, I think the different organizations all serve unique and valuable roles in our community. Um, for us, uh, we, have, we have a really important role, and this conference in particular has a very important purpose. You know, we are the leading advocates for the ESOP community. Um, as a 501c6, we can advocate. Um, every, ESCA, uh, as an organization, has a more limited focus. Uh, they have a very specific set of advocacy, and they uh, intentionally stay out of a lot of the other fights. We cover the waterfront, and this conference in particular, being in Washington, D.C., for 42 years, plays a critical role in protecting our policy structure, uh, in protecting the tax benefits that make ESOPs even possible. Without that advocacy, it all goes away. That's one of our roles in this community, the constellation of organizations. Um, a second role is we have this amazing infrastructure of chapters uh, and a local network of opportunities where you can all get together without having to get on an airplane, um, where CEOs can put two or three people into a car, send them to Columbus, and they can spend a couple of days getting really high-level uh, sessions. Um, and networking and developing people that they can pick up the phone and or sit across the table and have a cup of coffee with. Um, and then the other really important role in the place is, is the foundation, the Employee Ownership Foundation. And I think the foundation, you know, I've, I've, we've all talked about this at the leadership level. Um, we need to do a much better job of helping people understand the real value that has been provided to this community because the foundation has funded the essential research, um, whether it's with Dr. Blasey, who I know is in the room here somewhere, um, whether it's uh, through Rutgers or you know, funding studies at NCEO. I mean, I think people even know we help pay for a lot of the studies that they do. I wouldn't say a lot of them, but, but a, a number of them. Um, and we're, all, we're supportive of one another. And I think that we need to tell that story a little bit better. When you do that, I know you're going to be attending some of those. There's some new things that we're working with, some new partners we're working with as That's well. That's right. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, uh, they, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard about you know, the formation of state centers around the country. Um, and uh, there's this new organization, the Employee Ownership Expansion Network, uh, EOXN. Um, I think they go by EOX. Um, we were approached uh, about a month or so ago about serving as the, uh, the, the what's known as a fiscal sponsorship. Um, and when, when uh, an organization wants to become a 501c3, uh, it takes the IRS sometimes 12 to 18 months or so to review and then formally approve them so that they can receive tax-deductible contributions. 
Well, for a new fledgling 501c3, it's really hard to bridge that time. So you, the IRS allows a thing called a fiscal sponsorship, which basically means that an existing 501c3 can be a sponsor of an aspiring 501c3, and they can use our status to receive tax deductible donations, and we can pass it through to them with a certain amount of supervision. Um, well, the EOX approached us and said, hey, would you be uh, interested in serving as our fiscal sponsor? I think it took us about three days to work out an agreement, and we are, the Employee Ownership Foundation is the fiscal sponsor for the Employee Ownership Expansion Network um, with the goal of helping to set up state centers around the country. Um, I'm thrilled by it. I think it's a really exciting thing. Um, their goal is to help grow the number of ESOPs. Um, our goal is to help grow the number of ESOPs. Um, I know that uh, a number of the state centers come to our chapter meetings. It just seems like, why wouldn't we do this? So I was really excited about being able to make that accomplishment. It's fun to, fun to see that growth and that ability to cooperate, but yeah, make sure the ESOP Association continues their focus of being the over, over, over uh, side of the, the, the ESOP family to be able to take and do the things that the ESOP community needs to be done. So that's great to see. Looking at some other questions I'd put down here, is your chairman a pretty likable guy? Yeah, you know. Uh, I don't know who put that on the list here, but. He wears some weird socks, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't These tell are you. the normal ones. So. Um, you know, in the last 12 years, I've worked with dozens of national trade associations um, as an outside advisor and counselor, um, which means that I've worked with a lot of presidents and CEOs, and I've worked with a lot of uh, board chairs. And I got to tell you, whether it's- a great it's, board. Yeah, we have a great board. Um, you know, you have, your, your past chairs are amazing. You know, Cindy Turcott uh, and Dave Fitzgerald. Um, the, the leadership of this organization, um, well, it, it, honestly, it's a reflection of the caliber of people who are participating in ESOPs. Um, so yeah, you're a pretty decent guy. Yeah, yeah, I do have a gavel now though. Yeah, I know, I'm watching it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This afternoon, over the noon hour, we're going to honor Michael Keeling. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a fun event. Talk a little bit about your transition time with Michael and what you've learned. Um, I've learned a lot about Jake Pickle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Michael, Michael will, has forgotten more than I will ever learn about employee ownership. Um, he is truly an institution, um, and, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm actually not going to talk too much about Michael because I'm going to be talking at lunch about uh, about what I've learned about Michael. Um, you know, it's, I've got big shoes to fill. Um, he has been with this organization basically since day one. Um, and the, it's amazing what's been accomplished in this community. The ESOP Association is such an organic organization um, that the chapters have really formed on your own. Um, there's been a lot of support and funding and um, signing of contracts to allow the rental of hotel rooms and some programming and you know people like uh, Dan Marcu and your chapter ministers that, that all of that support uh, is there helping to to advance the, the, the mission but the organization has really grown um, organically and that's a little unusual in the association space often it's it's um, it, it's artificial, it's forced. Um, it's, uh, uh, I don't want to say contrived, but you know, pl there's marketing plans and uh, you know, we're going to make an investment in this area and we're going to focus on growth in this. You guys have all just sort of, you know, it's like a big garden um, that, uh, that has, has grown on its own. So that's pretty cool. Um, but Michael's been there through the whole thing. And you know, 29 years as president and CEO is an accomplishment. And I can tell you, um, I'm gonna say this at lunch as well when Michael's there, one of my tests for a leader is how does the staff, how do the people who work for them feel about that person? Um, and I can tell you, there's a lot of loyalty to Michael Keeling. Um, and that speaks well about him. You know, before I took the job, before I accepted, I called a friend of mine um, who's very familiar with the association, and I asked, how's the staff gonna take this? How's the staff going to deal with this transition? And her response was, well, it depends on how Michael is treated. Um, if, he fe if, if they feel like he's being mistreated in any way, you're gonna have a, a problem there because they're loyal to him and they care about him a lot, as they should. 
So that told me a lot about Michael Keeling. And we'll get a chance to honor him at noon today. So I hope everybody is here. Some of the stories, some of the background. Uh, I know Dave has been working on some history facts there that he'll be talking about at noon. So it's been great to honor him. The rest of the program, we have a couple of other things coming up that are fun. You mentioned Frank's program on Friday morning. That's going to be just a terrific program. That is. I, uh, I've had a couple conversations with Frank. Um, on the first conversation, he was literally going through White House security uh, on his way to catch a flight with Ivanka Trump to Indianapolis to talk about labor and employment issues. Uh, the second conversation, he was calling me from London. Um, and it was funny, it, it, Frank Luntz is uh, uh, one of the most accomplished communicators and researchers uh, in the world. I mean, he's really a brilliant man. And, you know, he confessed to me last weekend when we were talking, he goes, you know, listen, Jim, I got to tell you, I've done research for just about any kind of business, any kind of industry, you know, the top leaders in the world he said, I'm a little nervous about this because, you know, the employee ownership is one of those things that people haven't really studied a lot on communication. So he's like, uh, he's boning up. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a terrific presentation. If you haven't seen Frank speak before, it's very interactive. So y'all be, better be ready to ask him questions. He's going to be walking around the audience, and we're actually going to be calling a few people up on stage with him to go through some exercises right here in front of the audience. I think it's just going to be a terrific session. And then Dr. Blasey talks at noon tomorrow with some new research that is pretty exciting for our community. It is very exciting, and we're not going to announce it to the, this morning, but. Um, uh, the, the team at Rutgers has been uh, you know, diving through data that they've just recently gotten back, um, and it shows some just eye-popping um, revelations about how Americans overall view employee ownership, view employee-owned companies, and again, I talked earlier about the importance of the, the funding that the foundation has provided to this research. Um, this stuff is the fuel that supports all of our policy efforts. Um, and what's great about it is that it, it's, it's independent. It has, it has um, actual um, rigor to it. Uh, all too often in Washington, you get fake studies. This stuff's real and it's, it, it wasn't manipulated. There was absolute integrity to the process, and it's, it's, it's really interesting stuff. So uh, I'm excited about Mark that. Mark Lamelli, uh, who's chair of the foundation, right. in which case you can go out if you haven't contributed, jump in and do that because it helps fund that very thing. And, and I think you can also win like a thousand bucks or something like I, that. Well, there's two prizes. There's a, there's a booth at the other end of the lobby if you haven't been there yet, um, and there's a drawing. Um, where uh, at one level for a contribution, it's uh, I think a $500 uh, prize, and at the upper level, it's $1,500. Um, so yeah, it's a real opportunity, and they're going to announce the, uh, the Winter results lunch. at the lunch tomorrow. Let's wrap things up, Jim. Um, you mentioned something that really at home, if the American dream is to have a house, probably the second in line, or maybe first in line, is to have a business that you own shares in, that you help build, that you're part of that family. If you had to pick out three points that say, here's some areas of focus for me that I want to have to get to that point, to tell that story to not only legislators, but people in our own communities, why the American dream is to work for the, or to own shares in the company that you work for. How do we tell that story? Do you have three areas you're going to focus on? Um, I'm not sure I would have broken it down into three areas that I would focus on in that way specifically, but I think that we do need to begin an education process uh, where, where people become more connected to what they do uh, and their value creating abilities. Um, you know, when, when our country was first founded, if you've, uh, if there, there, there's some great books about this. One of the most hotly debated topics at the Constitutional Convention was about wealth creation and ownership. But at that time, it was about, do you have a farm? Do you, ha are you, do you have a trade? You know, are you a blacksmith? And it was really directly connected to your own skills and labor. And the ability to create wealth and the ability to, uh, to advance your own interests. And literally, during the formation of our, of our country, of our government, that was one of the most discussed items. You know, how do we make sure that people, individuals, don't get separated 
from their ability to create their own value, their own, their own wealth. And I think we need to modernize that because I think so far too many people uh, have become separated from their own ability to uh, create their own success. Um, like I said earlier, I think uh, you know, the American dream uh, has been portrayed as having a, a home. Um, I think the American dream needs to evolve into having your own ability to create your own wealth, to determine your own course, um, and to be an owner. Um, and, and I think that uh, employee ownership, the ESOP Association, is, is a good mechanism to do that. Jim, that's a great way to end on right here. You'll be running around. I know you're very open with people coming up with ideas to connect with you, connect to the association website, uh, connect in whatever way, and you have multiple ways to do that. Now that you're tweeting and doing that, uh, you know, probably connect through that as well. Right. So uh, look forward to working with you uh, on the board. I know in our discussions that we had on Tuesday in the board meeting, we're excited to look forward to the next things that happen, the things that you help us do, and the future for the ESOP. Thank you for being here. The next sessions are coming up, so head to your next session. Jim, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll see you around. Thank you.